Hello and welcome to this exclusive webinar, Achieving Cross-Border Payments Excellence. This is part of the Reuters events Transform Payments USA campaign. Thank you for joining us today. I'm going to hand over to our moderator for this discussion, Linda Kuglenu. Hello, everyone, and, and James, thank you for the introduction. Welcome to the Achieving Cross-Border Payments Excellence live webinar brought to you by Reuters. My name is Linda Kublenu, and I am a VP Product Solutions Specialist at JP Morgan Payments. I am honored to be your moderator for today's session because we have a distinguished panel, and I look forward to insightful conversation. Before we begin, let's take a bird's eye view of the payments landscape. In the last couple of years, the disruption of the traditional payments ecosystem has been rapid and impactful. Geopolitical factors, capital market resets, technological advances, e-commerce disruptions, and societal responsibilities are all impacting the payments landscape. What I find exciting is that the payments ecosystem is projected to generate a global revenue of $3 trillion by 2026. The global B2B market is projected to surpass $1.6 billion by 2028. And the global digital remittance market is set to increase at a market rate of 15% from 2022 to 2023. There are several factors impacting this space, some of which we will touch on on today's call. This ever evolving landscape has provided opportunity for incumbents and newcomers to come up with innovative solutions. Some of the topics that we'll discuss on this call is how the rising cost of funds is impacting international payments, the current status of instant border cross-border initiatives, and the use of blockchain technology to make efficient, fast, and effective cross-border payments. We want you to leave this conversation with key insights that will inform your business strategy moving forward. I'd like to quickly add that this is an interactive webinar, and so we welcome your questions and your comments, and we look forward to addressing them towards the end of the call. Without further ado, please welcome my rock star panelists. So the first is Alex Holmes, Chairman and CEO of MoneyGram International, Carl Slabiki, co-head of Global Payments and Treasury Services, BNY Mellon. We have Sayantan Chakrabotri, Global Head of Cross-Border Payments Product at JP Morgan. And we have Nancy Pierce, Managing Director, Global Payment Solutions at HSBC. A big welcome to you all. I would also like to acknowledge um, everyone else on the call. Thank you so much for tuning in. So let's delve right into it. We live in a global world where people, businesses, and countries are able to transact cross-border. And you know, this system is underpinned by a robust payments infrastructure. And I just mentioned how fast the payment space is growing. But despite this growth, there still remain many challenges in payments. And so Nancy, this first question is for you. What are the frictions that you're seeing in the cross-border payment space and how are we addressing them? Thank you, Linda. And thank you for the rock star title. I greatly appreciate that. Fellow rock stars on the call. Um, so yeah, the, so let's start with the good news with cross-border payments. And that is that the majority of them, particularly in the business to business, um, space, but also in other customer segments, are completed quickly and efficiently, right? And we learned that, especially when, with the advent of Swift GPI, where we had more transparency 
into the speed at which and other factors uh, payments were traveling around the world. Um, and we've been pleased with the results, quite frankly, in our institution, and I'm quite sure in everybody's on this call, um, my fellow presenters. But there do remain friction points, as you pointed out. And when they do arise, they can slow things down considerably. They add cost, they take away transparency on, on the costs and the, the things as simple as a payment status. And there are cases where there's restricted availability for certain constituents as well. In fact, there is a multi-year effort underway by the G20 countries to do something about this and tackle those friction points. But think about cross-border payments by their nature, they are far more complex than domestic payments. They involve different country market infrastructures with scheme rules and operating hours that differ, different regulatory environments. The payments themselves are more complex in terms of their messaging structures than most domestic payments. <clears throat> and then by their nature, because they're crossing borders into other countries, they involve multiple parties. So this correspond the correspondent banking model that's been in place for quite a while and the Swiss, the SWIFT messaging network that underpins that um, is still at the center of most cross-border payments. This model has served us very well over the years. It's actually been responsible for the explosive growth in, cross, in um, handling those cross-border payments. But to meet the demands of a world that is more instant, more nimble, 24-7, all of the payment providers in the, in the payments business who use that model need to continue to develop it and enhance it. We have to keep working on it, as well as investing in some of the new models that you alluded to, Linda, that are emerging alongside it. In our view, the biggest benefits will accrue from continuing to look at the end-to-end -end flow, particularly the, the points in the payment process that cause the most friction, and that's the initiation from the customer and the, the credit to the beneficiary. There are a lot of things going on to improve straight through processing. It's all about straight through processing. When that happens, no friction. So a lot of efforts underway to improve that. There are things like pre-validation tools being developed, beneficiary account validation, a huge effort in terms of ISO and the enablement of structured party information. There's a lot of efforts to automate requests for information, inquiries, when things do go wrong, we need, to, we need to communicate about that and we need to automate that. And specific initiatives to mandate certain fields, purpose of payment in some countries, LEI, et cetera. So there is a lot going on to continue to enhance cross-border payments. I will say that the industry will be well served by making these imperatives right, so that all banks need to implement these because we're only as good as the weakest link in the chain. So that's one thing we should probably do more of, make these imperatives. Meanwhile, new, new models are emerging, um, brought in new players, payment service providers, digital challenger banks, technology companies themselves, new technologies, APIs, blockchain, um, payment options, wallets, for example, and even new networks. And you're gonna be hearing us discuss more of those new models um, as we go forward. So we really need to focus on both, enhancing the current and, and start investing in the future. Back to you, Linda. Thanks, Nancy. And, and, and that's a valid point. It's important to do both at the same time. Um, Carl, um, and anyone else on the panel, Alex Sayantin, would you like to add to what Nancy has shared? Yeah, you know, I, uh, I completely agree with, with Nancy on, on all of the points that she, she brought about. The, the one very encouraging sign that I see is more and more market infrastructures, whether they are country specific infrastructures or regional infrastructures or global, I think there is a lot more dialogue happening between the infrastructures themselves which I think over, over a period of time, we will start seeing more interoperability. So some of the friction points that Nancy talked about around things like account validation or payment scheme related rules, which often cause that point of friction either at the first mile of the payment or the last mile of the payment. I actually am very optimistic 
that the dialogues that are happening across the industry uh, have acknowledged and recognized those as frictions and actually people are working on it. So, um, so for me, I'm, I'm just like Nancy, I take a very optimistic view that, uh, that what we have in place has served us well, expectations are changing, but the industry I think is, is, is being responsive. Yeah, and I just add on top of that, right? I, I agree with a lot of the comments made so far. I think the exciting thing about where we're at now is we, we've kind of optimized, sped up, added tracking, and and you know between Swift and the banking community and some of the fintechs that play in the cross border space. From what we've done from a legacy standpoint, last several years, you know, to Nancy's point, actually moves fairly well, uh, very high SDP rate, et cetera. The exciting part, um, and then Santin hit on interoperability, is that. There's a lot of new things in the global market now in terms of instant payment schemes, things the card rails are doing, digital wallet providers that have a stance in different regions. And I think the market is in a time where it's saying, how do we absorb all of these new networks and make that interoperable with everything else that's been going on, right? Even outside of the B2B space, but in cross-border person-to-person payments and small business, et cetera. So there's a lot of work to be done because a lot of the new instant schemes are primarily domestic and they're exploring how do they offer and when do they offer cross-border um, payments? And whether that's just through rule change, whether that's through some sort of joint industry initiative like IXB, which was trying to do that between certain markets as well. So I think the exciting thing about the next couple of years is that how we connect those to the traditional payment system and infrastructure, which markets allow that and how, and it's likely gonna be a couple of different models that play out simultaneously that we'll all collectively need to figure out and absorb as we go down that path. Great point. Yeah, there, Carl. Oh, Sorry, go ahead, Alex. No, I was ahead. just going to say, I'd just add to that and say, you know, I, th I think what's so fascinating about the evolution of the world, um, you know, from a technology perspective and cross border payments view is that I think for a very long time it was sort of taken as a nice to have. Um, you know, most sovereign nations, as everyone has said, build their platforms for their domestic purposes. The flow of funds in and out is not really what, you know, governments and, and uh, people controlling economies are necessarily interested in, but I think in today's day and age, more and more, it's now being viewed as a necessity, not just a nice to have. And so I do think so many different companies are coming together. It's nice to see the banks beginning to cooperate. A lot of the central banks beginning to cooperate as well and beginning to think about the fact that, you know, these payments are actually flowing every day, trillions of dollars. And you sort of, you can't continue to ignore it in the sense that, hey, if it takes a couple, three days to settle, it'll be fine. And so people are looking for, you know, instant settlement. They're looking for demand. They're looking for, you know, where is, you know, my transaction at this point in time? And they want to see those 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 payment flows. So 24-7 settlement, moving away from, you know, five-day weekend delays, holidays, closers, you know, these things all have to change. And I think that the the world is is definitely coming together to to push it because it is a necessity, not necessarily simply a nice to have. That's a great point, Alex. And I think, so what I'm hearing is that there is more and more, um, there's more and more need for instant uh, cross-border payments. And I would like to, um, you know, talk about that a little bit, um, Carl. You mentioned that, you know, the domestic rails are um, more developed and now people want that in the cross-border payment space. Can you tell us a little bit more about what those initiatives are at the moment, and 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 what kind of um, and, and what kind of activity is happening in that space? What is being done to promote instant cross-border initiatives? Yeah, it's we're at an exciting point here because I think right, and if you just zoom back, right, it's a natural evolution of of where the industry was probably heading all along. I think the exciting part is that we're actually just accelerating it now because there's a lot of models playing a role in trying to solve this and the competitive pressures are kind of all collectively making everybody move faster and do more. Um, so so, so that, that's a, a positive for the industry as a whole and the end users that are going to get the benefits of that as, as it comes out to the market in different areas. So when I look at those expectations, right? In most markets, right, in the U.S., we've had RTP since 2017, right? There's 40-ish countries that have their version of instant payments that move on a 24-7 basis. Yet, when you go to a cross-border realm beyond that, even though you have those capabilities within the borders of your own region or country, right, when you go to the cross-border space, that kind of breaks down quite a bit, where you're then, um, beh you know, behold to the time zones, right, moving globally, the capabilities of who your payment provider is and what they can link together, whether it's high value, low value batch, 
um, or some sort of mix of the instant schemes where they do allow cross-border settlement. And it also gets very confusing too, right? Because you as an end user, whether you're a business or a consumer trying to facilitate cross-border payments, there's no way you would actually understand the complexity of what your payments provider is trying to stitch together behind the scenes to bring that all together, right? So I think we have a, and there's an expectation in the end user that like, hey, if I can move money between my account and Cyanthin and Nancy's account within the US instantly 24 seven, and I've built that experience, why can't I pay someone who's sitting in London in the same same manner, right? And, and that's, just, that's just a general expectation that we need to solve for. Some of the things that are going on, right, is that, right, you have Swift playing a role to say, okay, within um, the infrastructure that we provide to track cross-border payments and financial messaging, how do we continue to squeeze SLAs and actually track payments to add transparency and do that and do that to leverage low value clearing as well and instant schemes where we can play a role in facilitating that. You have the IXB initiative, uh, right, which is real-time cross-border payments that the clearinghouse um, was partnering with, with EBA clearing in the EU to say, hey, at least between the US market and the European Union, can we at least connect our systems, right, with, with RTP and RT1 and prove a model that can then be expanded to some other countries and at the core level of that market infrastructure, put some pipes in place to facilitate a model between those regions and pivot to some other big regions from there, right? So that'll continue to move and play out. And then the other thing is that, you know, we, we know there's a lot of instant schemes that while they've historic by rule only have allowed domestic payments, they're now exploring or already have plans to allow what we refer to as like one leg inbound settlement. Right, where if you have a traditional correspondent model with a foreign bank, you could actually use that domestic scheme to settle the, the last leg of that transaction um, and offer cross-border real-time payments to, to the global market as well. Right, So I think that those things are all gonna play out. IXB will keep moving. I think one by one, certain regions will start opening that kind of one-leg settlement model. And then banks will have to sit together kind of comprehensive routing solutions that says, whether it's high value, whether it's low value batch, whether it's it's kind of instant schemes, right? How do I kind of bridge that together globally so that my client just has to tell me who do you need to pay and where? What are the criteria in terms of speed, availability, finality, even cost or, or principal deduction, right? And then the payment providers are going to have to work with this kind of very fast changing market to, to say, how do we bring this all together? How do we pivot knowing it's going to be changing very rapidly? Thank yeah, and that. maybe, uh, uh, you know, just to build upon what, what Carl was saying, you know, some of the things that uh, I think about from an industry perspective. So the first one being, like, historically, uh, messaging in cross-border payments, it has always been possible, at least for, for a fairly long time, it has been possible to move the message that Carl wants to pay science, and that message can actually move real time. And it does move real time. It's the money uh, or the liquidity that doesn't move real time. And, and I think that's that's the challenge, right? That's that market infrastructures are working on, which is how do we create a finality around settlement that yes, this this money is good, and then we can actually settle, uh, and, and these are good funds, and so that uh, the payment providers can act in a near real time basis. Because the end of the day, even if the first mile and the last mile can work on a millisecond basis, if the processes in the middle take six hours or twelve hours. The reality is we cannot offer an end-to-end -end near real-time experience. So I, I feel there are a lot of uh, factors which are coming to some sort of a confluence where I think we are addressing those settlement problems. I know there are some payment infrastructures in Asia, for example, they are thinking about how do they settle on the back end in near real-time basis. IXB, as Carl said, also try to address this, this problem. So I feel like models are evolving, which will address this question of, the messaging and the money moving separately, creating that friction, and hopefully we can we can solve that. So, um, and I think the good news that many providers independently actually solve that problem already. You know, many payment providers actually fund their own account and use their own liquidity to offer their customers like a near real time experience, even the physical settlement, even if it's not happening in real time. So, so I think the competitive pressures I think are actually great because they will force everybody. To kind of meet that expectation. Great points, Anton. Does anyone else else have um, anything to add? Um, I, think, oh, I was just going to quickly add. I mean, and we talked about the customer driver. What's interesting and, and it's important because of all the stuff that you guys are talking about about that we have to work on together is that the regulators and government bodies are also very interested 
right? So they're they're driving this as well, and because they want to facilitate trade, commerce, economic prosperity, you know, all of these drivers. So it is a possibly an inflection point where we're going to start working together a little bit better than we we may have done in the past. All parties to the uh, to the payments ecosystem. Thanks, Nancy. Um, blockchain technology has become, you know, a huge buzzword in the last couple of years. And it sounds like, you know, a lot of institutions, especially, or, or a lot of players, especially fintechs, are making the case that blockchain will solve a lot of the problems that you've highlighted, Sayantin, and, and Nancy as well. Um, and this question is for you, Alex. How do you see blockchain technology impacting the cross-border payment space and, and you know, solving this issue of liquidity, settlement, and all of these greater frictions that we've, we've highlighted so far on the call? Yeah, uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating topic because I think everything that, that is being discussed on this panel, right, is really about the friction around the world because of the different messaging platforms, the different payment schemes, the different way that, that people communicate, obviously the foreign exchange translation and, and a variety of other components come into play that make cross-border payments extremely complicated. You know, Sayatin correctly said, you know, someone like a MoneyGram, we've created our own network and we use our own pools of liquidity to settle transactions real time so that we can facilitate, you know, these payment flows. And that works extremely well for us, but it does create uh, a cost, right, associated mm -hmm. with that because we have to, you know, pre-position funds with banks. We have to, pre, you know, sign up partners to help us move the money and go through the settlement processes. We have to create our own, you know, compliance platforms and our own schemes and these types of things. And so, and it works, you know, works wonderfully well for the customers that use our platform, but it is not, you know, sort of a standardized system. Uh, and there's a lot of different opportunity out there to, to think about it differently. I think the the promise of blockchain, whether we ever achieve this or not, I think is is around that sort of standardization, right? And it, and it gives you this opportunity to think very differently about interconnectivity and interoperability between countries, between banks, between payment schemes. And it gives conceptually a standard around how do we all interact and how do we all speak? When you can take currency and you can tokenize it into an asset that can be traded seamlessly between parties across networks that that connect and, and speak with each other, it, it gives a different opportunity and a different um, view to the back end. It brings to the front end a different opportunity for consumers to think about how money can flow uh, and how payments can move. And I think to Sen's point as well earlier, when you think about messaging and moving money, those are completely separate things today. And so what really blockchain also brings is that opportunity to actually move the money with the message. And I think that that is, you know, at this point, wholly unique and something that completely transforms uh, the payment schemes and the payment rails um, that we that we currently use today. Now, that being said, obviously, you know, moving to, a, you know, toward a standardized scheme, you know, is not necessarily in everyone's best interest. There's a lot of different schemes out there. There's a lot of different blockchains. There's a lot, a lot of different platforms. And so it also can become equally complicated um, as you think about it. But if you're looking for uh, speed, openness, transparency, and to me, most importantly, standardization and, and a messaging platform that allows people to connect um, across platforms, I think blockchain uh, is certainly unique in that sense and, and obviously brings um, a big opportunity um, to to consumers, uh, in particular, as they look at how do I connect, how do I move payments, and then the backside of that is then you know the regulatory pieces of it and the government interactions and all the banking interactions and everything else that has to happen to facilitate those payment flows. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Alex. Does anyone else have something to add to that? It's it sad from my perspective. You know, I think. You know, I think Alex hit the point on kind of the expectations of what it promises to solve for in the industry. And I think just generally speaking, right, we, we try to look at what what are the challenges that that exist, right, in terms of availability of the service to the end client, right? Typically kind of business hours or or, or, or settlements, right, in different markets, especially gets more complicated when you go to global cross-border payments um, that are operating in different time zones, right? The speed of the service. And, and like Santin kind of pointed out, not just the messaging, but actually the speed of settlement and funds availability within those mm -hmm. and the challenges around kind of atomic settlement and doing that on two different schemes and systems and different markets and networks and how you solve for that. 
um, right? And then ultimately the transparency around it, right? And we always kind of go back to getting rid of that little disclaimer, which is like your payment's been set and then it's like, but wait, right? Either the service is not available yeah, yeah. or the funds will be there next days or we'll tell you like when it's like, so, so trying to get to a point where you don't have to operate in a disclaimer, right? And it's just like done means done, right? In terms of all elements of that. Um, and I think, you know, I guess our kind of view is that something is going to solve for that. And it's really just a question of whether that's blockchain technology, whether it's the speed at which SWIFT or the other market infrastructures globally with the clearinghouse and EBA clearing and the central banks can innovate on top of some of the domestic rails or whether, right, some other consortium entity kind of pops up and uses blockchain or something else to solve for that and who can do it fast and who can do it best, right? There's going to be competition around those competing models to see who can get us closer to that disclaimer free world that we all kind of want to live in from a, from a cross border payments <laughs> perspective. <laughs> Yeah, I just, you know, to add a little bit more on that, you know, I think what's so fascinating about it too, and I think Nancy said this earlier, is the, you know, consumer preference is going to begin to push these, these types of opportunities, right? And that's what's so fascinating, I think, about today's day and age with technology changes, with the improvements in banking is everyone is out there pushing hard to find, you know, new solutions. And whether it's some of these, you know, global schemes that are coming together, whether it's individual blockchains, whether that's, you know, People pushing the envelope with, um, you know, new payment schemes, new fintechs, you know, new kind of shadow banking. Um, all of these things are out there trying to give the the customer a better experience, more transparency into what they're doing. They're trying to lower costs as well. Um, they're trying to take out that friction and they're trying to reduce um, basically, you know, the pain points that consumers face every day today. And you know, when you're when you're moving money cross border that lack of transparency, that lack of, um, you know, seamlessness is really what, you know, causes a lot of the, the problems um, for a customer, you know, looking at how do I get money home? And I think that the, the opportunity definitely exists. And I think Carl well said that, you know, again, it's the promise of these types of things that come together. I think there's a ton of schemes out there today that are trying to take advantage of that. And if I look, for example, at how, you know, we move money 200 countries and territories, 24, you know, 24 seven real time, you know, presentation, settlement, et cetera, uh, with our partners and trying to make that as transparent as, as we can for our, for our customers. When you think about, you know, blockchain, when you think about, you know, the, the use cases and the pilot we're currently doing with Circle and, and Stellar today, you know, we're taking money and we're, we're effectively tokenizing it in, you know, into a USDC stable coin. And it's giving the customer then the opportunity to think about, what money is, where is it sitting today? When do I need it? How do I access it? And what are sort of those touch points look like? Um, and it's very, very different, I think, from your traditional, I need to get it from person A to person B, or I need to get it to myself across the border and it's gonna take a couple of days and I'm waiting for some messaging to work. And you know, it's so creating sort of that that seamlessness is, um, is I think what's the most exciting aspect of it. And again, there's a, a lot of challenges with it and a lot of you know, evolutions yet to come. Uh, but I think uh, building that alongside the improvements that are going to be made to the core infrastructures that exist today and the current operating systems that are out there, I think is where it's all going to come together. I don't think blockchain is going to necessarily simply displace the current systems that exist, but I think it's supplemental to it. And I think it gives um, different opportunities to think about and, and how to view technology very differently and then how that plays a, a more seamless role in financial services. Interesting. Absolutely. And it sounds like the biggest theme here is attuning to client needs, right? And, and making sure we're providing um, the tools and resources that they need um, so that we can effectively, you know, create that payment transaction and, and, and allow that payment to go through. Um, and it looks like a lot of businesses are also um, thinking about their digital um, strategy. Um, and, and, and businesses that don't have prior digital strategy are thinking about ways to incorporate that in their businesses. Nancy, how, how, is, um, how, how are you thinking about that in your new role? Oh, sorry, excuse me, your role at HSBC. So in terms of our overall digital strategy, how does that affect your platform strategy? Is the question. Yeah, so we're focused. That where that has the biggest impact is is when we're focusing on improving the customer experience. And we, you know, we spend a lot of time talking or improving payment initiation, reporting, advising. But there's a lot of other interactions between the client and and the provider 
that create friction that we mentioned before. So we're re so our infrastructure strategy is really doubling down on all those other touch points with the client that we that we will benefit from digitizing. So that, that that's what we're focusing on. Um, in terms of overall infrastructure, I have to put a plug in for ISO, being that we're 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 working on this so. Um, as an industry, we're spending so much time and effort and money on getting ISO in place for our cross-border high-value payments and our domestic RTGSs, as, as you know. And we have to double down on that as well. You know, we're at we're at a critical uh, point in the journey, and we have to keep moving. We have to get it done because a lot of those pain points that we talked about earlier are will be addressed down the road by everybody getting that that new the new language of payments as we call it into place and that's across the journey from customer to bank to market infrastructure so we of course at hsbc and i know all of my colleagues here are working very heavily on the iso um iso work that we're doing so just a just a focus that we all have to keep um Keep on top of, and then other things that I think we're hearing that that a lot of banks are focusing on, as we are, in order to help digitize everything, is we're we're trying to break down our infrastructure and build micro like more of a microservice architecture around the core. You know, we we have built over the years these very big, wonderful, heavy payment systems, expensive to run, operate, and instead of just replacing them, a lot of the banks didn't just re place them and make them ISO native during this transformation, but they've been building things around them. So we're, we're functionalizing our architecture. So I, I know a lot of people are doing that and, and looking at different ways for interfaces using APIs to interface with your, all of your partner systems internally. And of course, to give your clients another option to use APIs instead of some of the traditional mechanisms. So all of these, um, all of these developments I think are happening across the industry. A lot of the banks that we talk to are certainly working on all of these elements. Yeah, I'll just maybe build upon uh, what Nancy said was I completely agree with uh, with Nancy in terms of these breaking down uh, these massive uh, pieces of uh, applications and, and technology platforms that do a whole bunch of things into discrete set of capabilities because I really think our customers, whether they are consumers uh, or they are businesses, they don't live to do payments. I mean, they have their own lives to lead, which is their personal lives as consumers or as businesses running their business. So I think how, how do we make payments a part of their life, uh, invisible, but functional, it works, simple, rather than something that they need to think about that they need to become experts on. And I think this is where you know the microservices piece that that uh, Nancy talked about. I think is really really important because it allows to embed payments experiences in in their day to day interactions. Uh, you know, one example or a story that comes to my mind. It's actually something uh, one of my team members uh, told me recently uh, was, uh, and and the provider shall go unnamed. That they sent money to their cousin in in Pakistan, and they were just about to you know take out their phone as soon as they made the payment to send a WhatsApp message saying, hey, I sent you money. And, and the person said, hey, before I could send the WhatsApp message, I actually got a message back from my cousin that the money was in their account. Mm. And to me, that's the power. And I think that's the aspiration that I think the industry uh, needs to have. And I think it's possible. I think with all of the collective willpower of the industry, the networks, the regulators, as Nancy said, and the tools that are available at our disposal, this promise of digital, uh, to me, is like it's within our reach, and, and the good news is, I think people are working on it. Yeah, agree. That's great, Sant, and and I, I do think though that we need to address the elephant in the room, right? Which which is inflation. So, inflation has been a buzzword in 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 2022, and it continues to be something that everyone talks about this year. And you know, for the average consumer, it's about scaling back and, 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 and focusing on the essentials. And then for businesses, you have to think about, you know, your uh, mitigating risk and your cash flow, et cetera. 
And so how do you think that inflation impacts um, cross-border payments flows? And, and what about currency volatility? How do you think about these things um, when it comes to your planning? This is for Sianta. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, just as I was saying a few minutes uh, ago, I, I think our payments as about uh, people and businesses and, and, and them being more global in their interactions. So if anything, there are more people who are traveling and working uh, around the world outside their home countries. There are more businesses that are operating uh, globally. And I think a companion theme to what you just talked about, Linda, is also this whole notion of resiliency. So I think businesses are trying to become more resilient, whether it's their supply chain, whether it is their operations around the world. So to me, while there may be a shift in the mix of the type of uh, payments that flow through our uh, our collective pipes and the industry, and there may be a more focus around some of these current themes. To me, the longer term theme here is one of growth, because regardless of how this year shapes up, I think businesses would try to become more efficient in terms of how they source their raw material, how they sell to their customers. Small businesses are trying to reach their goods and services to around the world. Um, a customer base, which is more global through e-commerce platforms. So to me, all of those trends uh, are really positive for the business and which is really fueling all of this innovation. So to me, yes, will we see some shifts in the mix of payment flows uh, with the current conditions? Absolutely. Uh, however, uh, to me, the focus remains the same, which is how do we um, drive that economic growth engine uh, for our customers and, and consumer uh, around the world, how do we help connecting small businesses to customers around the world, which then powers and fuels local economy? And, and, and how do we build efficiency and resilience through all of the industry initiatives that we have been talking about? So, so to me, yes, there is a short-term pivot here and there to, to support the shift in the business mix, but the longer-term trends to me are, are very clear. Yeah, well, and I'll just add on to that. You know, I think some of the things that we're seeing as we move back to a higher rate environment, um, which we haven't seen right since pre two thousand eight, um, is is the spotlight that puts on the need for speed and control over over money movement. Right. So, from a, from a large business or a corporate treasury perspective, the muscle around kind of managing working capital day to day kind of got a little lax because it didn't matter as much, right? Depending on the values, right? Whether funds were coming in a day or two and whether you're squeezing kind of days payable, days receivable, or, or the options of what you can do from a either a borrowing rate or, or an investment rate on, on the excess cash that you need. Now that rates are moving up to a place that we haven't seen in over about 15 years, right? The need to actually tightly control and manage money movement from a corporate treasury level or cross-border level and what you do with the money one day makes a really big difference again. Um, and, and the tools that are available now, pre-2008, are kind of light years ahead in terms of the capabilities there. So I think what's, what's kind of been happening is that it's actually put a spotlight on and a demand on some of the new capabilities for instant real-time or even same-day money movement within borders or cross-border to facilitate and allow corporate treasurers to really tighten up their working capital management again, because it actually means some massive differences in terms of how you do that. And that's also amplified in the consumer, even in the small business space, right? Where we're having day kind of matters quite a bit, um, depending on what you're doing to move money, to control it, even to do it on nights or weekends or holidays and using some of the instant schemes that do offer 24 seven availability, right? It ultimately just gives the market faster, more on-demand capabilities to move money. So you know where the money is and you can actually do things with it to either pay down debt or invest it, et cetera. Um, and all of that gets amplified in a high rate environment. That's a great yeah. point. Yeah. Go ahead, well, I was just gonna, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just wanted to, to add, you know, from an inflationary perspective, um, you know, it does, you know, from a cross border, you know, for, you know, our, our set of consumers at MoneyGram, um, you know, it does, tend to have an impact, obviously, you know, anytime you're, you're looking at sort of discretionary spending impacts, um, you know, it puts pressure on, on those consumers' lives. What we saw through sort of the pandemic and over the last couple of years has really been, you know, increases in face value being sent home, which may be in some respects somewhat counterintuitive, but it's a nice offset to, um, to increasing costs and, and increasing uh, challenges. And oftentimes when you interview uh, the migrant communities and families who are actually doing the sending, 
they're they're going to tell you that they're they're taking a little bit less on their side right there to make sure that they're maximizing the money sent home and so you know when you think about inflation we think about rising rate environments you think about costs going up impacts on currencies and fluctuations of value you know it really does come back to sort of the 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 secondary elephant in the room that i always get talked about which is you know kind of cost and pricing and 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 how do we sort of look at the fees that are being charged and how do we kind of reduce those costs and i think it's it's a pretty fascinating time right now because there's just an extraordinary amount of pressure on bringing prices down and doing things you know for free in essence um, but you're trying to do that against the backdrop of increasing costs and again inflation drives costs for for businesses um cash handling costs are expensive um things like compliance have been driving an extraordinary amount of costs for businesses over the last several years there's a bit of a paradox happening as well in the sense that you've got things going digital which is great from a ux and an interface and you know a, a customer perspective but then the opposite becomes true because now you've increased the risk of fraud and account takeovers and online risk management costs are going up and sort of driving these things. So there's a huge uh, balance that needs to be met out there. But at the end of the day, the more efficient that we can make the payment platforms, the more efficient we can make the money movement piece, the lower we can we can bring those costs down. And I think, um, you know, our focus at, at MoneyGram has been largely around that over the last several years, which is how do we move more digital? How do we improve the user experience at the same time? driving down costs. And when you start looking at improvements to payment schemes and you start looking at moving money sort of digital to digital, you can drive down a lot of costs and you can make um, make the, the transactions a lot more efficient. And we've been able to globally get our costs down below 3% of face on a tr per transaction basis, which is actually the World Bank's goal for sustainability by, by 2030. So we feel like we're well ahead of that. And when you move completely digital, the costs are even you know well below that. So I think it it all comes full circle when you start thinking about, you know, how do we improve this? What's the necessity to improve everything that we're doing when you add inflation on it, when you've had, you know, a rising rate environment on it, when you're at increasing cost, it's going to impact consumers disproportionately. And so you, you do have to come back to how do we continue to take costs out of the system? And, and, and it just sort of makes the necessity to improve the payment landscape um, all that more um, necessary and, and urgent. That's great. And Alex. making sure, yeah, making sure that you're addressing all those cost points across right. across the uh, the journey. Yeah, it's, so, it's very tricky. Yeah, agree. Sorry, Linda, good to you. No problem at all. I'm conscious of time, and we have a lot of questions coming in from the audience, which is great. So I'm going to read through a few of them so that um, we can have our panel answer. Uh, as these types of cross-border payments options expand and become easier for the client consumer, what do you think will happen to traditional correspondent banking? This is from Carol, and um, anyone on the panel can respond to this. So I'll start. Um, you know, I think some of the new models we see evolving are just um, um, additive evolutionary trends of traditional correspondent banking, right? And the one example I gave of that is, right, so if you look at a domestic real-time payment scheme, whether RTP in the US or MPP in Australia or UK faster payments, as some of those begin to allow what we call kind of one-leg international settlement, um, what we do with like international ACH today, right, there's correspondent models in place that can actually facilitate using those rails for instant cross-border payments, right, to allow um, banks and their, their respective clients across the globe pay into that local market and use a correspondent banking model to partner with the local bank and use that domestic scheme to facilitate instant 24-7 settlement, right? So that's one of the things evolving, right? And it takes traditional models. It just speeds it up. It changes the rails. It changes the networks. It changes the infrastructure. And ultimately, the downstream is that banks across the globe can offer a 24-7 instant experience with instant transparency and you know, a confirmation of payment to their clients, but there's also other models evolving at the same time in parallel, right? Which which ultimately would change the models and could potentially link um, some of those domestic schemes together directly, either with or without some sort of correspondent model, right? Or or um, entities that try to facilitate that kind of on top of or as an overlay service to some of those banking rails as well. So I think the correspondent model will continue to evolve and continue to get better and adjust to use different schemes to settle. And then we'll also see other competitive models evolve as well at the same time um, that, that will coexist. I think, uh, you know, at its core, correspondent banking has always been about 
helping banks around the world to connect their customers in their markets with opportunities outside their home market by working with other banks. So I think whatever the underlying rails are, I don't think that need is going away anywhere anytime soon. So to me, it's as you said, Carl, it's more about the evolution of that, which is how do you support the new models? And then I think Alex made a point previous a lot of these models will actually continue to coexist uh, for a long period of time. You know, I mean, new, new things will come along, you know, where that blockchain becomes mainstream and gathers critical mass. And then I think the correspondent banking model will have to evolve to accommodate that. You know, I, I think things will come along the way, which will evolve the model. But I think those things will coexist for a, at least for a fairly long period of time. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I mean, banks are, are not looking necessarily to increase their footprint all over the world. So they're still going to be working with other banks and other providers um, to, to be able to service their customers. And that's why we have those models to begin with. So I think there'll still be a need for them, but they do have to evolve. And as you guys have said, there is going to be new models that are going to coexist um, and, and probably grow. Probably over time, there'll be more growth in the newer models, perhaps. But I think we'll still have correspondent banking needs for quite some time. Thanks, Nancy. This next question is for Alex. Can you speak to how MoneyGram has operationally become customer obsessed to uncover these customer preferences and address them with new products and services? Yeah, um, I, I can give a, a, a brief advertisement here. I don't want to take up the whole panel on um, everything that, that we're doing. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, right, you know, everything that, that we're talking about is seamless interoperability between countries, between um, currencies and, and effectively helping consumers move money home. And what's what's pretty fascinating about it in, in many respects is what are the use cases associated with that? I think we always tend to think about cross-border uh, remittances as being a, a, a consumer moving to another country, working, getting paid, and then sending money back home to, to support the family. And while that is one use case, and obviously a, a super critical use case, it is only one use case. I mean, there are uh, second, third, fourth generation um, you know, migrants that are now living in countries, sending money back home. Uh, there are people operating across um, multiple borders. Uh, I think Sam said, you know, for, for business purposes, there are um, needs for uh, making payments, small payments, paying bills, buying things, right? So the permutations go up. And, and one of the things that we always largely, I think, overlook is the need to actually send money to oneself. So when you're in a foreign country, sending money back into a bank account or into a wallet or, or trying to create things that are more um, interoperable. And so when you're, when you're in a situation where you're trying to make this seamless across borders and across countries, um, standardization of products and services can can be um, quite complicated. I think what's nice about many of the payment schemes that are out there, MoneyGram being one of them, is that we create a standard for our customer base and they know they can rely on that. And while it varies a little bit in terms of which domestic platforms you're in, interacting with in a specific country, the seamlessness of, of knowing you can use a MoneyGram service to get money back home um, is pretty critical. And so when when you start to think that way, and start to think about what's the best user experience? How do you make the presentation layer to the customer right? How do you sell that service? Then you start to get in all the permutations around financial services and the evolution of, of your app. You move more into, um, you can give customers the ability to store funds with you, you give the customers the ability to buy, sell, interoperate um, domestic goods and services, cross-border payment, interacting with, with different bill pay rails, plugging into um, domestic wallet schemes and others that um, then enable you to uh, also on the same phone make payments and do things in the domestic markets. And so you really have to think about um, the broad swath of use cases in, in, in terms of how do you make life simple? I think she hadn't said it best, which I always think is great, is most people aren't waking up every morning thinking like, oh, I've got to go make a payment today. I'm so excited, right? I, I'm actually going to send, some, you know, it's, it's a need. It's a necessity. It should be easy. And it's a very serious matter and it's something that you know is not not taken lightly and so the more transparent you can make it the faster the easier it is um and you know and i think beginning to bring in uh crypto beginning to bring in blockchain beginning to bring in these things to test use cases with consumers to to sort of push the envelope around what are they looking to do how does that vary by market 
how do I create the right, you know, um, opportunity for success? And so we were just doing an extraordinary number of things. And over the last really five to 10 years, we've completely overhauled our business and digitized our network. Um, at the end of the year, we had about 47% of all our transactions were digital. Uh, I think that's an amazing feat considering, you know, about 10 years ago, that was more like three or 4%. Um, and, you know, being one of the largest, you know, cash to cash money transfer companies in the world to be able to say that almost half of everything we do is completely digitized is, is pretty remarkable. So I think it shows um, what you can do when you begin to leverage technologies differently, when you begin to think differently about consumer needs and, and start thinking about the experience you're looking for uh, and not just sort of your own platform. I think it it's transformational for, for organizations. Right. And, and Alex, um, MoneyGram's recent launch um, of a digital product in Brazil, right? It's one way of ensuring that um, access to uh, for customers to be able to reach their friends and families worldwide. So that's great. Um, I think we have time for one more question from the audience. I'll pick a simple one. How does AML and real-time risk monitoring co-evolve with this? Um, Sayantin, would you like to answer this? Yeah, so I think um, to me, the starting point always is that when money moves across the border, especially electronically and especially faster and faster, we need to know uh, what is the source of funds, where does the money come from, who's sending the money, whom is it going to, and what are the patterns associated with it? I think you know our regulators want to make sure that banks, financial institutions, other participants in the infrastructure, they are all really collecting and utilizing that information to understand uh, what the risks are, what the trends are, what the patterns are. So that's at the heart of what we try to do. And, and, and I think the, the question really then becomes, okay, uh, how does that then either impede or accelerate the speed of payments, right? And, 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 and to me, this is really about tools and, and becoming smarter. Right? I think all the uh, participants, most large institutions, I think invest very heavily uh, in that area uh, and, and really are constantly thinking about how do we do that uh, better. So, so to me, again, it's an evolutionary process. Uh, a lot of the processes and tools were built around uh, a traditional cross-border payments world, which was considered to be a T plus two. So you made a payment today, the payment would reach somewhere else in two days. And, and, and those tools, I think are evolving. And, and I think, as I said, the industry is, is doing a good job there of, of making those tools more responsive to that customer experience. So to me, the fundamental driver of knowing who's sending the money, where is the money coming from? Where is it going? Is it, what purpose is it being used for? I think that requirement remains, whether it's a, 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 a T plus two uh, wire or, or it's a payment that is getting processed in, in three minutes. That's great. Thank you for sharing that. I would like to give the panel um, one minute to give their final thoughts on, you know, what they would like to see in the payment space. What's what's something that we're not focusing on enough in cross-border payments, and and what would they like um, to to highlight in this space? I will start with Carl. Yeah, I, th I think there's two things I'm excited about. I think one is. Um, which I think will start happening in 2023 is the opening up of certain corridors that'll facilitate real-time instant cross-border payments. And I think that'll just accelerate the drive for other countries to do the same and follow suit. And ultimately banks will leverage that as part of their solution, right? So, so I, think, I think we're at a point now where that will kick off a little bit of a snowball effect um, to, to really open that up. And then the other thing that I mentioned um, is kind of on the back of Santon's answer to the last question, which is, I think as an industry, we need to solve for fraud information sharing more broadly in terms of how we leverage industry network data across banks, across region to help get better insights into fraud prevention and risk analysis and the management over that. Because if you kind of take the existing model of banks just seeing their own piece of the pie and their own data, it's limited in what you can do from a risk and a fraud prevention perspective. So I know in the US and globally with SWIFT and with others, those are there's a lot of discussions around that, but I'd like to see some progress around how do we actually tactically start doing things in that space so we can collectively um, protect and uplift the, the network and the risk management that we do across the board? Thank you, Carl. Nancy, any thoughts? 
Well, I'm going to repeat something I said earlier, and that is we need to finish the job. We need to finish the job of transforming our payment infrastructure to ISO. That is going to reap tremendous benefits, and we can't lose sight of that, and we have to complete it. And then I'll underscore Carl in terms of that real-time payment um, expansion, because I think a lot of the growth for cross-border payments will actually be taken care of by um, the real-time payment schemes. Thanks, Nancy. Alex, what about you? Yeah, I, you know, for me, I think if, if all of this is going to come together for the purposes that it, that it should serve, right, which is, is to make frictionless, more seamless cross-border payments available to, to everyone because it is such a need and, and, and it is a necessity for so many hundreds of millions, billions of people um, around the world each and every day that sort of rely on these types of services. I hope that the new payment schemes, that the improvements that we're all looking at, the partnering that we're doing, helps the compliance side of it get governments to release sort of many of the restrictions that they've placed that have causing things like bank de-risking and other challenges that are just driving more expenses, right? And again, you know, I, I shared earlier that it's a little bit circular to me because on the one hand, we're becoming more digitized, so things are becoming more transparent. On the other hand, you know, things that the Satin pointed out, purpose of transactions, source of funds, where's the money going? Then they take into account you know, the country, the government, and then you sort of get into these schemes where, you know, banks begin to get de-risked in foreign markets, you can't get access to US dollars, and then the whole thing kind of falls apart. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, if we're going to spend time, energy, money, and effort to put forward better payment schemes that address these concerns, my hope would be that then the governments would participate in these processes to actually then enable more seamless payment flows and not actually end up in the opposite, which is putting more restrictions on it, which then sort of breaks it all down and then forces more cost into the into the market. So for me, I think the end of bank de-risking would be a, a huge outcome from, from all of this and something that I think all of us need to continue to be very focused on and and uh then you know leverage with you know governments around the world to to continue to push for improvement. Absolutely. And you know, to 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 your point, the success of the future of cross-border payments would require collaboration between all stakeholders, right? From government, the private sector, to businesses, et cetera. So um, thank you all so much for your thoughts um, and your insights. And we hope that the audience have picked up some key insights and strategies from this conversation. I would like to invite James, who is our producer for this session, to share a few words. Thank you, Linda, and for everyone's insight today. This webinar was part of a series of discussions that are ongoing around the future of digital payments transformation. We will be meeting in Austin this June. Reuters Events is hosting Transform Payments USA, 13th to the 14th of June. We will be tackling many of these topics and more, and you can see some of these speakers live there in person. Um, I'll put the link in the chat, but stay tuned for more. And thanks again for attending. Awesome. Thank you all so Thank much you. for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.